and welcome to Unleash Monday, where we talk about the brain, especially the gifted brain, and how does it affect our thinking and experience of the world differently. There are a lot of stereotypes and stigma around giftedness, and I'm here to challenge those. I'm here to raise awareness and to have a conversation around this topic of what does it mean to be a gifted adult. Common experience among gifted folks is that they feel out of place. They don't quite fit in. They are too sensitive, too intense, too emotional, too overexcitable, and too deep thinkers about the world and about themselves. So if you have been called too much of about anything, then this show is for you. My name is Nadia. I'm too loud, too colorful, too bubbly, too bossy, and I love to talk too much. So welcome to my world, and I'm so happy you are here. Hi and welcome. I hope you're having a wonderful start into the new week. And I just want to say I'm so happy you're here. And I feel I gained so many new friends by doing this podcast. People reaching out to me and saying how this has touched them. And also, I'm now a little bit more fluent in the vocabulary of giftedness and neurodiversity. So I Google those keywords and I go on LinkedIn, for example, and I follow the hashtags. And that's how I found today's guest, actually. So Tracy Winter is the guest. I found her on LinkedIn and her LinkedIn profile was so intriguing that I couldn't resist but simply invite her. So when you go onto her LinkedIn page and obviously all the links to the websites and to LinkedIn and everything that we're going to mention in this episode is listed in the show notes. So you just scroll down there and click the show notes and you can find all the resources there. So what Tracy writes in her about section is really exciting. She says, I'm an executive and leadership coach who helps people who are brighter than the average bear learn the soft skills they need to be successful in their work and life. More simply, I help smart people stop saying dumb things and start making themselves understood better to help them get promoted. And I love this because isn't that exactly how gifted people get stuck at work and maybe even in a career trajectory. And sometimes they don't even know that's what hinders them to get ahead in their career and why they feel sometimes so out of place. So that's why I was intrigued. And then I even learned that she wrote her PhD dissertation on giftedness. She wrote her thesis called Being Seen, Self-Concept Development in Highly Gifted Adults. So, I mean... You cannot get any more insight into giftedness and what it means to apply all that knowledge into basically daily life, your career, and just have a wonderful conversation with somebody that really understands giftedness. So that's why I invited Tracy. And I don't want to say more. She's going to speak for herself. And I'm so happy to share this amazing interview with you all. So please enjoy. Welcome, Tracy. I'm super excited to have you on the podcast today. Thank you, Nadia. I'm really excited to be here. So thank you for asking me. So I saw your LinkedIn profile and I saw the header picture and I was instantly jealous. <laughs> you have like a row of ducks and one is wearing a Star Trooper helmet. So it, it was so cute. And you call yourself a nerd coach and... May I just ask, like, what is a nerd coach and what exactly is it that you do and why is it needed? So I am an executive and leadership coach um, and I'm certified through the International Coach Federation as a professional certified coach, which is like the second level. So I use those skills, which is a lot of asking questions and helping people reach their goals. So for the nerd part, I like to do it with really smart people. So yeah. The gifted information is really helpful and very specialized that a lot of people don't know about, even gifted adults themselves sometimes. Things that can get in their way, like intensities and overexcitabilities and things like that. So, And that can make them also have trouble in the workplace because they don't necessarily fit in or people say they're not team players. And even when they're trying their best and it's sort of not working. So I help them overcome that and help them move past that. I also have help others on the neurodiversity space. But the giftedness is really my my strong suit, gifted in ADHD. So how did you get into the topic of becoming a nerd coach? I don't think that's something a lot like on the radar for a lot of people as 
their career dream. I guess you must have an interesting story to share as well. Well, it's not like I was a little girl of five years old and thought to myself, I will be a nerd coach one day. That's exactly what I want to do. No. Well, so I got interested in giftedness. I think it's always been around me because I had my IQ test when I was like four and they skipped me a grade at the time. And so, you know, this has sort of always been around. And then my mom became a gifted and talented coordinator for a school district and she built a program and got her graduate degree in gifted education. And so, so that part of it has always been a part of my life too. My little sister's also gifted and was in a magnet program. I didn't have like a giftedness discovery. So it's just sort of been there. And so as I was getting into my graduate work and thinking about what do I want to research as a dissertation, what's interesting, gifted adults was what kept coming up because I haven't read much on gifted adults and there's honestly not much out there to read on gifted adults. And so I thought this is a population that's sort of underserved, really. It's an underserved population and people think they're okay just because they're gifted. And that's not necessarily the case. And so I made that the focus of my graduate work and wrote a dissertation on social emotional needs of gifted adults. And then it was like, okay, so I have this, but I don't have a, it's not a clinical psychology degree. My PhD is in human development. So I was like, well, what do I do to actually help people with all of this knowledge I've gained, you know, getting this degree and coaching seemed like a good, good route to go. It's fun because you're helping people come to self-awareness, but also making that like implementing it. Right. So changing behavior based on that and making actual life better, not just because you're aware of something new, but because you're doing something different and you're getting different results than what's worked before. So you just mentioned you you were identified early on and that was always part of your identity. But I guess as a child, you also didn't really know what it means to be gifted. And growing up with your research, you learned so much about the topic And I think the majority of the gifted people don't know. Like, I think there's so many unidentified gifted adults out there. And then all this prejudice around the term. And I saw on your website, you don't mention giftedness that much. You you mentioned nerdiness and like if you're quirky and you're a quick thinker and you have like issues at the workplace. So just for the listeners a little bit to to kind of like I think there's a hesitancy like I think people are interested in the topic but then it's hard for them to embrace it for themselves so could you give us a few examples of what are the issues in the workplace that could come up that you think that's a gifted thing and you could use a gifted coach <laughs> Yes, I can do that. And you're right. I think people have trouble embracing it, which is, you know, the G word is really loaded for some reason, which is why I sort of avoid it. I say people who are brighter than the average bear when I'm talking about my practice, because it's, it just makes people chuckle instead of recoil. So there's a couple different things that I might see from my clients in the workplace. They're often high performers, high achievers, right? So as an individual contributor, they're doing excellent work and their managers are really happy with the work they are contributing when they get to go off and work on their own and come back and present. They may have trouble socially as gifted people often do growing up and all that, especially if the other people on their team are not at their level. So it's the same thing as kids, you know, who are in the wrong classroom, having trouble connecting with their age peers because they're not their mind peers. The same thing happens as an adult too. So learning how to translate oneself into the language that other people need to hear it. That helps things like people might not hear your ideas if you present them the way that you understand them, which is really conceptual and really a little bit vague, maybe abstract. And you might not even express all of the idea, even though you think you did. So other other people aren't going to receive that very well. They're going to be like, that's, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, let's move on. Or you learn what they need to hear in order for them to receive it better. And you get kind of skills and I call it translation. I guess you you learn skills to translate yourself into the other. I think this can also be especially hard because so one of the things I studied and was the topic of my dissertation was how reflections from other people can really impact your development. Kind of like mirroring? It's exactly. Yeah. Can you quickly explain what it is? Sure. So self-concept was first talked about in the 1900s. And it's the idea that, so if I'm interacting with Nadia, right? I am saying something and then I imagine how 
Nadia is what, what you're thinking and feeling about that. And then you respond to me and I'm interpreting that as well. So it's all my interpretation of your stuff, but what you do can have an impact on that interpretation to me. So I think about like gifted kids, a lot of times get what I call funhouse mirrors instead of like regular flat mirrors. So they're, they're not getting an accurate reflection. They're getting the reflection that people expect them to be this way and they're not. So they get this reflection of being weird and do that enough times as a kid, as you're growing up and you could become an adult who's expecting that to happen. And it's hurtful, you know, it, it is emotionally hurtful. And now we're talking about people who have sensitivities in those areas and who feel things very deeply with intensity. And so it becomes even more sort of entrenched. So by the time they're adults and you're still getting these reflections as adults and it's still affecting your development as adults, which is what I wrote about. So you're in the workplace and you're getting this reflection of, you know, I don't have anything of value to add or nobody gets me or why, why can't I fit in? It's the same things we think about in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, all the way up. And it's, so it's hurtful. And so by the time we're adults, we've learned to become very self-protective and not put ourselves out there to get a reflection really. You know, we've got this sort of hard shell that they can bounce off of, but that also means that other things bounce off it that we don't want to, right? It makes it very hard to make connections. So that's kind of part of what we talk about because it has to be sort of an opening up and letting people see you, but also in a way that you feel safe, right? That you're not putting it out there too much, but little by little, you know, you can get to be more of who you are at work. And just to clarify, I think... I never heard the term mirroring before getting into this topic of giftedness. Uh-huh. I I grew up and there was always a little bit of like, you know, not fitting in and being a little bit weird or quirky or whatever. But I think if that's the only experience you get as a child and growing up, it's so hard to understand that your experience is not the norm, that what your experience is because you're gifted. But because you didn't fit in and you got this like, it's kind of negative feedback and at work, you also like, there's rejection and then you doubt yourself. You're like, well, if I'm smart, I should be able to figure this out, but I don't. So I don't feel smart. So I think a lot of gifted people, they actually don't really feel smarter than others. And so what you're saying is really obviously on point, but I think it still doesn't really help the people to, to, to kind of connect to, to say, oh, this is what it is. But you already kind of like mentioned a few things, like if, if you actually deliver great work, but you have this constant rejection. So who would you say, are there more like tell signs or? That's kind of a big one. And sort of the feeling that you have at work too. Because I I hear what you're saying. I was identified as gifted at four and still didn't really understand like why weren't the other, I assumed the other kids were asking the same questions that I was, you know? So even when you're identified, it's a weird thing, right? You just assume everybody's like, we know intellectually that nobody's like anybody else. And yet when we're experiencing it, we sort of assume that they're doing the same things that we are. So that sort of feeling let down by your team too right? Because you're assuming they're, they're operating at your level. And it's like, and there could be a couple of responses. One is you guys don't know anything. Why aren't you, you know, operate? That's like silly. But another one is that people that I've seen give to people who, especially who don't recognize it, like you're talking about, they think they're missing something. Like they understand it's, it's so clear and so simple that they're like, no, this can't be it. This can't be all of it. I must be missing stuff. And there's, so there's your feeling not feeling really bright, right? In those moments, because like everybody's getting this, except I don't think that I am because they're like working through this. And it seems like that's obvious, but okay, let me, let me look deeper. There's gotta be something deeper. And sometimes there's not, right? (laughs) So like, that's a weird thing um, that happens when you don't really get that. Sometimes it's just you. Sometimes it's just that you got it all already. But being able to figure out which time is which, that's a challenge too. Yeah. And I think one story I heard was somebody telling me that she really got like annoyed and angry or yeah, really impatient with her coworkers because she had the feeling like they don't want to, they don't want to work, you know, faster, deeper, better. (laughs) And, And, but she didn't understand that 
they had a different capacity. Capacity is exactly the word I was thinking of as you said that. Yeah, they have a different capacity. And there's got to be from the gifted person, like knowing that is the first step to accepting that, right? Because if, if you don't, if you think they're all just being lazy or not trying, like you're going to be pretty angry with them a lot of the time, right? You're going to be frustrated. And so the part of what I want to do with what I do is it seems like there's a lot of emotionality there that doesn't have to be spent. And that's energy that you could be putting into the thing that you're doing that is so amazing. And you have these great ideas doing like, wouldn't you rather spend that energy over here? So by coming to the understanding of, no, they're all trying, like they are all operating at their capacity. You would just have a different capacity than they have. So, you know, that kind of takes the emotionality out of it, right? Oh, that's just, it's just like a fact. It's just sort of how it is. I can't really just like, they shouldn't be upset at me for how I am and just how I'm born and how my brain works. Like, I can't be upset with them about that. Okay. Now you've got more energy to cure cancer or whatever. I mean, that's, that's the way I think about it is we need to, you know, this emotional baggage that we have, we need to remove it from our gifted adults because they're the ones who are going to do these extraordinary things that are going to impact the whole world. So don't we want them operating at top capacity? Yeah. And would you say it's kind of a cultural difference then a little bit that we are not even aware of? I mean, like gifted culture versus neurotypical culture and gifted culture, like that, that's kind of like how I thought of like, if you don't understand that there's a, there's a cultural difference, you, you can get a little bit annoyed, but as soon as you realize, oh, it's kind of like, I don't know. Yeah. It, there is a difference. And the most kind of example I could think of was like a cultural difference, mm-hmm. but I'm, I'm not trying sure to think of that, that because there is a gifted culture. But a lot of gifted adults aren't part of that gifted culture, right? If they, especially if they don't know they're gifted, they don't accept their giftedness. They're not reaching out to organizations like SANG, which is supporting the emotional needs of the gifted to connect with other people like them. So to me, it's, it's maybe more basic than that because it's not a social construction that you are thinking in this different way. It's not a social construction that you are feeling things more deeply. That's just the way your physiology is right? That's just the way that that your brain is made and your nervous system is made. So like, I find it even more basic, but foundational, Hmm. the kinds of things we're talking about. Culture is something that can be moved, that can be changed, that can, you know, evolve into different things. And I think there is a gifted culture and it's helpful when people who are part of, you know, realize they're gifted, kind of find other people who are like them. Right. And that's something that the culture stuff is doing. That's part of saying that's part of saying Euro. But I think what we're talking about is stuff that can't be changed. This is how you are. This is who you are. And so, yeah, it's not, it's not a learned. Right. Learn is more the adaptive thing The the culture would then more be kind of like fitting in and trying to adapt to the neurotypical work situation. And I do think that And so like, there's also Mensa, you know, people join Mensa to find other people like them too. And I think the more you can find that true understanding, that flat mirror reflection that reflects back to you the way that you understand yourself, the easier it is then to, when you're not in those situations to be okay and do the translation that you need to do and adapt because you can't really deal with a thing until you point to it, right? That's a basic of therapy or coaching or anything. You got to make the subject into object. So as soon as you can go, oh, that's a thing that's happening. That's part of me. Interesting. So I can be all of me here and over here. I can be all of me, but I have to translate it Mm. because that is something different. Right. And that sort of like makes it a little more linear, just sort of matter of fact, honestly. There's not a lot of emotion attached to that. It's just how things are. Yeah. I would like to talk a little bit more about this whole struggle of people resisting, you know, to self-identify and to really embrace it. Because for me, and I think the people surrounding me, it really gave them a lot of answers. And I think it's easier to self-identify or identify with being a gifted adult if you already been identified as a kid in school but I think in Europe and 
Mm-hmm. Uh, probably a lot of other countries and continents. The people that were identified are usually from the U.S. So if you then confront somebody in their 30s or even 40s or 50s, it's it's kind of like a shock and there's a lot of stereotypes. So yeah, you and I were on the same page. We really mm-hmm. want people to be less <laughs> resistant and embrace it a little bit, uh, especially when they look for a coach or a therapist. What are your thoughts on this? Do you want to share a little bit? Like, what would you like to say people that are like resisting? <laughs> Um, to people who are resisting, like, I'm not going to argue with them, right? There's obviously something getting in their way of accepting this. And so that might be, and this is a very coachy question, it's sort of like, what's getting in the way? What comes up for you when you think about this, that makes it difficult for you to even consider the idea? They say, oh, I'm not good in math, or I feel as we said before, at work, they, they feel a little bit stupid because they think, oh, I missed things. My One of my professors in graduate school who is brilliant, absolutely brilliant, was convinced that she wasn't gifted because she always scores high on the verbal and the writing. And she was the writing person in our, in our university, mm-hmm. but it doesn't score well in the spatials. So her full scale IQ was always sort of you know, gifted, but not like high. And I was studying high giftedness, highly gifted. Um, she's like, no, that's not me. I'm going, you've got to be kidding me. Like, I don't even understand what you're talking about. And by the end of my dissertation, I had convinced her that yes, she does fit in this category, but like she was 70. Wow. Right. And brilliant and, and capable and secure in herself. And just this amazing woman. So like, So what do you do with people who are resisting the concept? That was the question. There's evidence, right? And you can talk about the different things that people don't know about giftedness. Like I was surrounded by it my whole life and didn't know about Dabrowski until I was in my studies. Had never heard of it. And he's like the main theorist in gifted, you know, emotionality and personality development. So explaining that there are different parts of it and that it's not just being smart, but it's this qualitative difference, as the Columbus group definition says, that you are actually getting different information than other people are. You're getting more intense information. You're bothered by more things. And there's a way that you're putting together patterns that is different from other people. So there's the emotional side of it, the part where you just don't feel like you fit. And that could be for any number of reasons, but that's one place to start, right? So, okay, what what about you do you feel like doesn't fit? Yeah. Yeah. And by by saying all of this already answers also the question, like, why is it important for people to to actually seek a gifted coach or a gifted therapist? Because I heard a lot of people say, you know, I had a coaching session, I had a therapist, it didn't work. But because they weren't understood, they were mirrored back again by the therapist, usually a gifted coach or gifted therapist probably the chances are high it is also a gifted person at this point in time yeah. that, that's how they got into the topic so then there's already this person able to relate to you as well the thing that I've heard most from like friends and family who tried out therapists or psychiatrists or whatever is they think beyond them they think circles around them so like their suggestions are not useful because they're not recognizing that this person is a different, is a different thing going on. So they, you know, it's really hard to find someone who is honestly bright enough to keep, to challenge them, to challenge the gifted adult. So that becomes a thing. So yeah, you're right. I would think gifted therapists, gifted, I mean, we study ourselves. That's what we do. So if we're in that field, yeah, likely it's a gifted person. My therapist, you know, I had tried a few therapists and the therapist I have now when I got to her office, I noticed Dabrowski's theory of positive disintegration, Selman Dalio's book on her shelf. And I was like, I think this is going to go well. And you know what? It went well and it, you know, still going well. So just having an inkling that there is something different because of that, you know, kind of grab onto that and run with it. Yeah. So now that I talk to people I believe I can see giftedness in friends. And obviously, if you tick the boxes, 
in the checklists for gifted adults, the first reaction is always, oh, I need an IQ test. I need to get tested before I even can, you know, call myself gifted. Then people are also hesitant. So I feel that unless they have an official IQ score, they don't dare say it out loud that they are gifted. And that also then hinders them in the whole process. They might read a book, but they like, who am I to reach out to a coach and call myself gifted? Yeah. I mean, that's, and my mom, when she was coordinating the program, when, and now when people ask her, cause they know that her expertise, you know, should I get my child tested, IQ tested? And the answer is always, what, what do you need it for? What's the reason? And for kids, at least in the States, it's usually to get into a gifted program or get services, right? But she always, when she was doing testing, she said, I just knew who they were. And she was right, like all the time. She said, I just have to look in their eyes and I can tell. So yeah, so as gifted adults, you know, and our IQ tests are more are more accurate when we're younger too. By the time we're adults, it's like, I wouldn't want to take an IQ test now. I don't think I'd score as well as when I was little especially because now we know the pressure of it, right? Like you want a thing, your brain's going to be under pressure to perform, which is never the best thing, et cetera. And giftedness is about so much more than IQ. Like it's the quick and easy way to talk about it, right? Two standard deviations from the curve, three standard deviations from the curve. You know, those are the different levels. And also it's about intensity and it's about, you know, not understanding. And it's about the not fitting in part. And it's about overexcitabilities and never being able to shut your brain off because everything is so interesting. Or having shut your brain off entirely and not being interested because it was so overwhelming. Like there's so much more to it. And so I feel like the the label gifted is helpful in adults to identify each other. And also it's sort of more about what are the symptoms I suppose, like, what are, what are the things that are about giftedness that are showing up in your life and how is that affecting your life? Right. Are there certain friends you're deeper with? What are they like? If you would say all of your friends are gifted, but you're not, I'm going really, really, (laughs) you know, I do that with, it's true in families too. They'll say, you know, Everybody used to get very stressed when I would say what my dissertation topic was about when I was in classes and things and webinars. And then on the break, they'd always come over to me and be like, okay, so I'm not gifted, but my kid and tell me all about their child. And I'm like, okay, you're in a PhD program. You're understanding what I'm saying. You're asking me about your gifted child. Chances are, right? So so I think the label can be helpful to just sort of accept, but I'm not sure an IQ test is what you need to do it. Hmm. Yeah. And thank you for saying that. And so your clients do not need a certain IQ score to come and work with you. No, they just need to feel out of place. You know, <laughs> they just need to be, honestly, they need to be having trouble at work. And w- the way I'm trying to put it out there is I understand these special, these other dimensions that you're feeling and that you, you know, is part of you that maybe other people don't understand. So that makes me a better fit, in the, let's say to give you some reflections that are accurate. I hope. The biggest fear I hear from my friends is, as you said, like the longest time they didn't fit in. They were always the odd one out. And then now they're reading books about adult giftedness. They can relate. They tick all the boxes. But they're scared. Because it's the first time they fit in a box. (laughs) Like the first time. And now they're scared that it's going to be taken away from them. Like they don't want to admit it openly to somebody like working in the space or being like, you know, the expert, the professional saying like, no, you're not. And so that that's also a little bit of a, I think, a hesitancy to reach out to a therapist or a coach because they finally, finally found some sort of answer but then they're so scared that somebody's going to take it away from them. Oh, that's heartbreaking. It's really like, what a terrible fear to live with. Like you finally found a piece of your identity that you feel fits. And the idea that they would take that part of your identity away when you're just sort of getting used to it and reveling in it a little bit. Okay. So the first thing I would say is any therapist or coach 
who rejects you based on your IQ or rejects you based on like, no, you're not gifted. You don't want to work with them anyway. Hmm. You just like, yeah, I can't even fathom saying that. The question is, do you have some difficulties? Do you have some challenges? Do you have things that are getting in the way of you living your life the way that you want to live your life or being the person that you want to be? Okay. Now find someone who understands that giftedness because you have intensities and you have overexcitabilities, right? So yeah, I don't know a gifted therapist who would say, who would challenge somebody's giftedness. Like there's not usually a qualification to go see a therapist. And I would imagine the therapist, even the gifted therapist, see people who are not gifted. So going in and saying, so I, I think I'm gifted. And one of the problems that, you know, and really one of the challenges that you're describing is that they could use therapy or coaching for is accepting their giftedness. Exactly. That's an issue in and of itself. And I keep saying therapy and coaching as if they're the same thing, which they're not. They have served different purposes, but they can sometimes address the same issues. So, yeah, but I mean, that alone, right, is a reason to see somebody to help you, like, allow that to be a part of you and really integrate it. And what does it mean for you? And how is it getting in the way? And how, what can we do about that? So what I hear you say is, don't let anybody talk you out of it. <laughs> if you can relate, nobody's going to take this away from you. If you find you can relate on such a deep level, no therapist or coach working seriously in the gifted sphere, they won't reject you and say, nope. <laughs> so this fear is a little bit, um, it might happen if you talk to somebody that's not qualified to talk about giftedness. That happened to me actually. And I was not being taken seriously because I was like, but I'm gifted. And she's like, yeah, sure you are. <laughs> that's a horrible feeling. So I can understand people, you know, starting yeah. slowly out so it's just i, I want to create a safe space saying if you're the person that could use a coach but doesn't really dare to embrace it or is scared that your coach might say you're not gifted please reach out to tracy because <laughs> he's gonna make you feel good <laughs> i hope so like and i've had that experience honestly one of the professors that i thought was going to be on my dissertation committee when he really understood how, like what giftedness and how I was defining it and how, how much this was a focus, I got a 45 minute phone call where I said nothing. And he told me all about why giftedness isn't a thing. <laughs> and I got off the phone and my response to that was not giftedness is not a thing or not. I'm doing the wrong thing or any of those things. It was okay. So that is not a person that I am going to work with. That's all. Like, it's okay. And I'm not going to convince them otherwise. I don't argue, but okay. So that's not who I'm working with because I'm working about gifted adults. And so it's the same thing with a therapist or a coach. Like, you know, if they reject you, you say, okay, so you clearly don't understand what I'm looking for. That's not what I'm looking for. So that's not a reflection on me. That's just, that's how things are. And I'm going to go find somebody who does meet my needs. Yeah. Is there anything else you would like to share for the listeners? Something you wish people would know, your clients would know, or something, you know, you wish you knew earlier? Such a wide open question. It's challenging. Or you can mention different things if you have multiple ideas. <laughs> so if you're looking for places to like meet other people like you, then you're gifted or to check it out. I'm a really big fan of saying sendgifted.org. I have met several really interesting, brilliant, caring people there that get it, just get it. I would say find the people who you fit and they may be different, you know, hordes of people for different parts of your personality, just like everybody else, but like find the people who get you. It's important. Find the other stormtrooper ducks. Um, what else? I would just say have some self-compassion as you're going through this because it can be a big deal for you. and so. Be kind to yourself and allow yourself to feel whatever you're feeling. Think of yourself as if this were happening to a friend, what would I be saying to them? Chances are it's nicer stuff than you're saying to yourself. So, you know, think about what would Nadia say to me, right? In this situation, it's probably going to be something nicer than you're saying to yourself. So self-compassion is really helpful. I know Nadia, the Mary Elaine Jacobson book, Gifted Adults, you found very helpful. I found it very helpful. My dad, who was very gifted all of his life, finally like accepted it going through her checklist. 
it was, it, I was a little like, really, really? You're 60 something? <laughs> after you wrote the dissertation? <laughs> after, yeah. after you've been working in the gifted sphere, that was what he needed? Yeah. Yep, that and my and my mom had been working in the gifted sphere the whole time. Oh, yeah. And my dad had been identified as gifted when he was a kid, but that's the thing that put him over the edge. Okay. So it's a there, you know, when you find a powerful tool, use it, I suppose. And if anybody is looking for coaching that I can be helpful with, you know, get in touch with me. My website is www.nerdcoa.ch. So it's nerd coach with the dot before the ch. And I'm happy to happy to talk to you. Yeah, and we're going to list all the links that you mentioned and everything that Dabrowski and the Gifted Adult book, we're all going to put everything in the show notes so people can just click and, and find the resources. Oh, terrific. Let me throw one, one more in there because I mentioned Selman Daglio's book, but it's pretty academic. So there is another one called Living with Intensity that was edited by Michael Piachowski and Susan Daniels. And that one is much more applicable. So if people are interested, you might start with Living with Intensity. Oh, wow. And so if people want to reach out and work with you, do they need to be a nerd? Do they need to like Star nope. Wars? No, nope. they don't need to like Star Wars. I'm not even a Star Wars key. I like it, but I'm not entrenched. I just like a stormtrooper duck. So no, they, they should absolutely like, if you're listening to this podcast, chances are you would be a great client for me and we would get along well and work together. And if not, I will find you someone who will. So yeah, do reach out to me. I offer 30 minute conversation. Just to get to know each other and see what coaching is about, see what it is that you need and see if we click. So that's no risk. Just give me a ring. Thank you. And if people want to see also your LinkedIn profile, it's one of my favorite LinkedIn profiles I came across. That's how I reached out. That's how I, that's how I found you through your LinkedIn profile. I was like, oh, wow, I like that one. <laughs> so I'm also going to link your LinkedIn profile in the show notes for people. Thank to you. I'm, I'm glad it was, I'm glad it was entertaining. What I found is the people who comment on that picture end up being people I like very much. <laughs> and I saw your profile. I read your about section and I was like, oh, this is somebody that's exactly describing the way I wish, you know, a gifted coach would describe themselves. But then I was like, but do the right clients find you if you say it this way? <laughs> so, but I think that, that that's why we're talking about, you know, the struggle of people identifying and, and get over themselves to come and reach out to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is honestly, that is the challenge is there's a lot of adults who don't identify as gifted, even if they were identified as gifted as a kid. Right. Which is one of the reasons I'm kind of moving toward neurodivergence as a way of talking about this because gifted people are also neurodivergent. But yeah, but if you do, come and see me. I'm happy to help. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you, Nadia. I appreciate you having me on the program. Thank you. And I'm sure we're going to keep in touch and maybe you'll come back at a later stage. So thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Bye. You as well. Thank you. What a wonderful conversation. I'm so excited and so happy to be able to meet all these amazing people working in the gifted sphere. And I just feel every time I speak to somebody working in the gifted sphere, it's like, wow, I have a new friend because that's really how it feels. And I'm just amazed how when you're kind of like the same wavelengths or like the same frequency, how it just clicks. And obviously every gifted person does have personality and you're not going to like everybody and anybody, but it's just... So far, it's been just so amazing meeting all these wonderful human beings. And I just feel like if I need a coach, now I know where to look. And it's funny that people actually ask me, oh, can you refer me to a gifted coach or can you refer me to a gifted psychologist? And I'm like, yes, listen to my podcast. And I'm happy to give you a list of everybody that has been on my show and also resources from my guests, you know, collecting all the links. So, yeah, I'm just so happy to be able to serve this gifted community in this sense and not just only gifted people, but also twice exceptional and all neurodivergent people that feel that this resonates with them. And even if you're not identified gifted, if you just feel this resonates with you, everybody that 
can relate or thinks this is helpful, obviously everybody is happily welcome to listen. And if you want to support this show, the best way you can do this at this point in time is if you go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen and give me a rating. Hopefully you give me five stars and you can scroll down all the way to the bottom and you can leave a written review. And that's basically, first of all, it's a feedback for myself. I get to see all these comments and then it also helps the algorithm to show this podcast to other people that might need to hear this message. So it really helps to get this a little bit more pushed and a little bit more visible for other people. So that's why that's important. And if you want to be notified for the latest updates, what's happening, I don't send a lot of newsletters, actually. But if you want to hear if there's something happening, and I hope something soon will come, then please, 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 uh, you can go to UnleashMonday.com and you can sign up for the newsletter. That way I can send you the latest updates if there's something happening in the background. So please keep an eye out if you already subscribed. And with that said, I really want to say thank you for listening. It means a lot. And I know that what I'm doing is really appreciated. And I appreciate you. So we can really help each other and raise awareness and yeah, make this world a tiny bit better and more joyful. So I'm wishing you a wonderful day and I see you in two weeks. Bye.